Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Quantum VC seminar series. This month, I'm pleased to introduce three of our Answer Create in Quantum Computing students who will be sharing some of their research with us. First up is Philip Suwon Kerwin. Philip is a Master of Science student in the ECE department at UBC, and as I mentioned, also an Answer Create in Quantum Computing scholarship recipient. And today he's going to be speaking about integrated quantum transducers. Please go ahead, Philip. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Lydia. Um, do let me know if there's any problems with uh, hearing me. Um, but other than that, I'll continue. Uh, so yes, I'm going to try and give you all a very brief summary of integrated quantum transducers. Um, I'm going to explain what they are, why they're important, uh, some of the key figures of merit, and of the physical implementations that we've seen in the last several years. So first of all, what is a quantum transducer? Uh, the basic goal of a device like this is to take one photon at some frequency and convert it into another single photon at another frequency, and to do so efficiently and without noise. So diagrammatically, we can kind of represent this as having uh, some, some mode A and some mode B and having some coupling between them allows the coherent exchange of energy between these two modes. And so we can think of a zero stage um, transaction scheme, and we can also think of a one stage, and in fact, an end stage transaction scheme, where we have as many intermediate modes in between our input and output modes as we want. So uh, in general, with these devices, we, we, our final goal is frequency conversion. And to do that, we need some sort of nonlinear interaction. And to enhance that nonlinear interaction, we use cavity rendering resonators. And cavity resonators is what a lot of the engineering of these devices revolves around. So um, some of the important things uh, within design of these cavities are the spatial profiles of the modes, the frequency spacing of these modes, and the losses of these modes, both intrinsic and, and extrinsic. So there's several flavors of transducers. Um, we can think of microwave to micro, microwave transducers, which rely on the Joseph's and nonlinearity, um, optical to optical transducers, which rely on bulk optical nonlinearities like Cat 2 or Cat 3 nonlinearities. Um, and uh, the focus for us today is microwave to optical transduction. Um, and there's numerous ways that we can actually make an experiment for this. Uh, and in particular, today I'm going to restrict our discussion to integrated on chip microwave to optical transducers. There's a few key figures of merit that describe how well these systems work. Uh, the first, and I'd argue the most obvious, is the conversion efficiency. And so this is simply the number of output photons over the number of input photons. So in an ideal situation, we want this to be one. Uh, another important figure of merit is the added noise, which is basically the number of extra incoherent photons that the transducer itself adds. Um, and typically, the dominant source of added noise comes from extra thermal photons from operating these devices at um, some finite temperature. Uh, another important figure of merit is the bandwidth, which is typically set by the smallest cavity line width in the system. Um, and some other uh, nice to have FOMs that will become more important as we, as this technology matures are footprint of each device and power consumption. And trade-offs exist between all of these um, figures. Um, for example, if you want to get higher conversion efficiency, a lot of times you're going to stop with bandwidth. So there's, there's uh, sweet spots for all of these. Some applications, um, briefly, we can we could use these transducers for access to optical and quantum memories. We can use them for distributed quantum computing. Um, we could use them for uh, using optical single photon detectors to detect microwave photons. Um, and generally, the theme is interoperability. So we have uh, quantum technologies that operate in the microwave regime and the optical regime, and uh, they each have their own strengths and weaknesses, but if we could put them together efficiently, then we could realize a problem. So now I'll start talking about physical realizations. Uh, the first and the one I'll spend the most time on is the electro-optic approach. So in these devices, the nonlinearity that we're making use of is high to electro-optic nonlinearity. Um, so pictorially, what we have here is we have um, an LC microwave resonator, uh, where uh, in, in between the, the plates of the capacitor, we have an, 
helps build nonlinear material, and that itself uh, is sitting within an optical cavity. Um, and so, in on a frequency line, what this looks like is we have a microwave cavity, and then we actually have two optical cavities here, or, or rather, a cavity with two optical nodes, um, where the spacing between these nodes is equal to the microwave frequency. And so, uh, the red, the green mode, and the blue mode are what we actually want to convert between. And the red mode is there to compensate for this uh, 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 5 energy, dif energy difference between these photons. And so this is termed a triply resonant cavity. This whole thing is a triply re resonant cavity. Uh, and this is a general interaction Hamiltonian that can describe the system. Um, the important thing to note here is that we have this coupling strength uh, GEO. And this is basically where we shove all the geometric and material information about our system. Yes, but this Hamiltonian is a little bit uh, tricky to work with, so we want to make some assumptions and simplifications. So I won't go through all of these, but the most important one is probably to uh, use a strong coherent optical pump at this red frequency. And so now we can treat this, uh, this field classically, and we end up with uh, this reduced Hamiltonian, where we have this bosonic enhancement factor that depends on the number of pump photons up front. And the key thing to note here is that uh, now we have an interaction that's enhanced by just putting more pump photons in there. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with quantum optics, this is like a deep splitter type interaction. Um, yes, so after uh, getting that Hamiltonian, we can uh, plug them into the equations of motion and use input output theory to add some inputs and outputs. And we arrive at the efficiency that I introduced earlier. So this has two parts. First, uh, here we have. Um, we have some extraction efficiency. So this is basically saying how, um, how efficiently can you extract the signals out of your system after the conversion actually takes place. Uh, and then this term is the internal efficiency, which is parametrized in this parameter C, which is the cooperativity. And this is describing how strongly coupled uh, our, our microwave mode and our optical mode are to each other relative to the losses, uh, the cavity losses. And so uh, this is a plot of the internal efficiency versus the cooperativity. And you can see that our goal would be to reach the cooperativity of one. In practice, this is quite hard. State of the art is at about 0 0.1. So uh, from these equations, we can kind of think of some uh, important design goals. Uh, first, we would like to increase the coupling strength. So to do this, this, this is really about engineering the geometry of the devices and thinking about what materials we're using. Um, and then going a little bit deeper, we so that's increasing this G here. Uh, we can also think about uh, minimizing what's on the bottom. So uh, typically nowadays people use superconductors to build microwave cavities, and we also want to use high quality optical materials. Um, and then finally, in terms of the cavity design, um, we would prefer to have strong overcoupling to increase this external efficiency. Um, properly spaced modes and proper phase matching, of course, is necessary for this interaction. So that's also very important. Um, and then here's some representative examples in the last few years of uh, electro-optic um, converters that have been shown. Um, what's boxed in red is, uh, as far as I know, the highest um, efficiency that's been achieved on an integrated platform. So this was done uh, in Yale group. So they got 2%, so it's quite a long way from 100. Um, uh, in this experiment in the middle, they used uh, they, they really suffer in the efficiency, but they get really, really low. This is, this is very good. Um, so people are targeting different metrics, and uh, that's where, where we are right now. Um, yeah, and you can see that the kind of the, the, the trend between all of these devices is that we have optical ring resonators serving as the resonate, optical resonators, and then we have some sort of like lumped element superconducting LC resonator uh, for the microwave resonator. So some of the advantages of this uh, approach are that there are well-known material platforms, basically any high 2 optical material like benthyl lithium iodate or aluminum nitride, uh, you can slap superconductors on it and uh, make a transducer. Um, so the fabrication is relatively simple uh, in comparison to some of the other approaches. Uh, some of the disadvantages are that you need to suppress parasitic nonlinearities typically. Uh, they have relatively large footprints and uh, you need a large pump power to compensate for the small nonlinearities. Um, so small is relative here. We'll talk about how to get bigger nonlinearities in a moment. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk briefly about um, this the problem of having large pump power. So 
like we uh, like I talked about earlier, um, you need this strong pump to enhance and enable the transduction process. Um, so there's the, the expression for the productivity there again. Um, but it also has a lot of detrimental effects. So um, what I want you to focus on in this plot is uh, so we have the pump power on the x-axis and then the efficiency. And you know, as from this expression, we'd expect the efficiency to just uh, go up as we increase the pump power, and that's what drops under on this black dashed line. But in the experiment, what we actually see is this fall off as we go to higher and higher pump powers. Uh, and this is caused, this is due to several factors. Uh, I'll list a few of them here. First of all, the pump out, the pump can uh, break coup repairs in the superconductor, which is loss. Uh, it can also just generally heat up the whole system, increasing the thermal occupancy. And uh, all of uh, this and other effects uh, all serve to increase um, all these things that we don't want increased and really uh, destroy our, our, uh, our efficiency and increase our noise. Um, the other more practical thing is that uh, since these devices are operating at you know, millikelvin temperatures, um, if you're sending a huge optical pump into the fridge, that's going to be a lot of heat for the pump system, and we'd like to reduce that as much as possible. Um, so the takeaway here is that in this expression for Z, we'd rather increase the coupling strength rather than just increase the number of photons that we're pumping the process with. So how can we do that? Uh, one way to increase the electro-optic coefficient is, or sorry, the, um, the electro the, the coupling G, is to uh, engineer some sort of effective chi 2 nonlinearity using a three-level system. So what this practically amounts to is finding a, a particular type of defect center or ion and implanting a host material with it that has this particular level structure. Um, so because uh, so the nonlinearity is going to be very large depending on the frequencies that we're looking at. Um, and after we engineer this chi 2 um, a lot of the same design principles that I just talked about in the, in the earlier approach apply to this approach too. So, uh, like before, the expression for C is the same. I dropped the EO because it's not really EO anymore out of the G. Um, but yes, like I said, now you, now you have this additional knob to tune. You can get these uh, very high uh, chi twos. And so, some of the things that can increase uh, this chi two are uh, increasing the density of your defect centers, your ions. Um, and you also benefit from having uh, you know, good defect center properties, like large dipole moments, and you know, broadening. Um, so here are some uh, uh, examples of using this approach in the literature. Um, so these are based on rare earth ions. Um, you can see that the numbers are <laughs> a lot worse than uh, in the electro-optic case. Um, and that's and in these platforms, that's mainly due to the fact that the materials that they're making these on are really good optical materials. Um, so the, the fabrication for these isn't as developed as it is for uh, the materials that are used in the electron. Um, so some of the advantages are, well, the, the only advantage I've listed here, which is quite a big one, is that we can engineer these, non, these large nonlinearities that live close to the residences of these level systems. Um, so less pump power should be needed. Um, uh, but there's a lot of disadvantages to this. Um, you typically need to apply a magnetic field across the device in order to split these two uh, states because these, these are this public. Um, uh, you, like I mentioned on the previous slide, optical, the um, host materials are fairly poor optically, so are. Um, and the level system limits the frequencies you have available. So um, basically, that's the reason why erbium, for example, is has been uh, pursued in this area most because it has that nice uh, C band transition. Yeah, so some other approaches, which I won't go into, are magnon mediated uh, optomechanical schemes, which in a lot of ways are the most advanced um, in this area. And then there's also Rydberg atom schemes with atom atomic vapors to mediate the transduction, uh, and Rydberg exotons, which is a very, very new uh, approach, which is quite exciting. Um, so, wrapping up, so here's some, uh, here's a plot of um, the progress in transduction over the years. Article, uh, you can basically see that there's been this upward trend uh, closer and closer to uh, unity efficiency. Um, but of course, this isn't the, this isn't the whole story. The other figures of merit, like bandwidth and added noise, matter too, and that's not represented here. And also, this is like also non integrated uh, approaches. So, um, not everything here is, is integrated. Uh, so, in summary, these transducers could have a really big impact on quantum technologies. Um, there's been progress in the last 15 years of improving 
these are the numbers that are coming out of them. Um, some of the immediate paths for improving performance are um, improving the cavity geometries, for example, getting higher field overlaps. There's still a lot of room for clever design in terms of the cavities. Um, and that's what I'm focusing on in my work. Uh, and uh, also improvements of fabrication, getting lower loss materials, um, you know, especially in, in terms of superconductors, like engineering better interface losses. Um, there's still demonstrations underway on new materials to add to the plethora of platforms that have already been shown. Um, some exciting ones are aluminum, aluminum gallium arsenide on insulator, uh, which is out of the UCSB, and uh, uh, cuprous oxide, which is uh, which in which they're trying to use the rid of exophones inside cuprous oxide to do transduction. Um, so if I had to pick a holy grail for this area um, that I'd like to see, um, it's to do this on an integrated platform with an efficiency greater than 0.5 and added noise much less than one in the same experiment. We've seen this like. We've seen individually these things, but not together yet. And so here's some review articles. Uh, I recommend the one I pulled it. Uh, and thank you. So um, the people working on this project are uh, mainly uh, Muhammad Khalifa, a PhD student, and uh, Joe Salfi. So they've done the bulk of the heavy lifting so far. Uh, and there's also Lucas uh, Soski and Jeff Young, as well as the rest of our team. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, before we go on to our next speaker, were there any questions um, about Philip's research and presentation? You can either uh, unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Yeah, I don't know how much of this you can talk about, but I'm just curious because you you mentioned like these pathway to to get to the um the one at like 50 percent efficiency with also like low added noise. I'm just curious, like at UBC, like the 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 architecture that you and and your group is working on. Mm -hmm. So just on a high level, what is say like the 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 difference or like a new thing that you put in to kind of go towards that goal. Yeah, so I can't speak too much about it right now, but essentially we're exploring a new But yeah, <laughs> more news on that should be coming out in the next few months. All right, awesome. <laughs> Any more questions for Philip? Okay, thank you once again, Philip, for your presentation. Um, and we're now going to um, move over to the University of Victoria to hear from our second student speaker. That is Jamal Mohammed Khani from the University of Victoria. Jamal is a Master of Science student in the Physics Department, and he is also one of our Insert Create in Quantum Computing Scholars. He's just sharing his screen. Um, Jamal's topic today is all topical quantum C phase gate using RB. Adams. So um, I will pass it along to you, Jamal. Yeah, thanks. Um, is my voice clear? Yeah, we can hear you just fine and we can see you. Thank you. And we can see your screen. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, let me handle this situation. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Quantum DC for inviting me to discuss my research in the seminar. I also want to thank my supervisor, who has helped me a lot during my master's degree. Over the course of this year, I transitioned from a theoretical physicist to an experimental one, delving into the realm of quantum optics. This phase shift required me to trade equations and simulation software 
for hands-on work with the screwdrivers and optics table. Okay, today I'm going to talk about my research project, which is centered around the realization of an all optical quantum C phase gate using rubidium atoms. Before delving deeper, it is essential to address the question. Why opt for an optical quantum, why opt for optical approach over alternative methods? Well, with the invention of quantum computing concept, the development of suitable optical quantum technology became both interesting approach to the problem and a necessity. On the one hand, the advantage of using photons as information carriers seemed to be obvious. Photons are clean and decoherence free quantum systems for which single qubit operations can be easily performed uh, with incredibly high fidelity. On the other hand, quantum information handling with photon as flying qubits is required for communication-based quantum information science tasks, such as networking quantum computers and enabling distributed processing. In terms of traditional DiVincenzo criteria of a quantum computer, recently uh, all the requirements could be satisfied but since photons doesn't, don't easily interact, making deterministic two qubit gates is a challenge. That's why I'm working on making a controllable C phase or CZ gate. Since it's one of the fundamental quantum gates and its integration with two Hadamard gates positioned before and after enables the uh, formation of a CNOT gate for entanglement. My talk is simply structured to address both theory and experimental part of our work. I will also touch a little bit about the future directions. In the theory section, I will explain the core concepts of our experiment. Please bear with me as I start from the basics. We will use the semi-classical approach, treating light as a classical electromagnetic wave with its field, amplitude, and frequency. Conversely, you will consider atom as a quantum entity with distinct energy level and transition frequency. When light and atom interact, they can become uh, coupled. That means light can become coupled to the states of the atom. And we measure the strength of the coupling using the Rabi frequency. If the frequency of the light differs from the atom's resonant frequency, we can describe this with a parameter called detuning. Additionally, driving atomic states, always accompanied by a spontaneous decay at a rate denoted by gamma. Now let's, another, now let's add another level to the atomic system to make it like a lambda scheme. Uh, and couple that state, that new state to the excited state, previous excited state, uh, with coupling Rabi frequency with a yellow uh, omega C, omega, capital omega C. Now, the two photon detuning symbolize the lowercase delta in this slide, which is crucial for seeing the electromagnetically induced transparency effect, or simply EIT. However, atoms aren't always in a steady state. They interact with each other leading to the phasing of ground states, a process indicated by lowercase gamma in the, as you can see in this slide. By simplifying things and considering the state one as the zero energy state, we can write the unperturbed Hamiltonian represented as H zero. We can utilize this Hamiltonian to construct our perturbation Hamiltonian in the interaction feature. After applying rotating wave approximation, the final result looks like this. As previously mentioned, the two photon detuning or lowercase, del lowercase delta is a significant parameter. When uh, two photon detuning is zero, something is special happening, the dark state. The dark state emerges as an eigenstate of interaction Hamiltonian. The dark state is fascinating because it lacks an excited state component. As you can see, we just have a state one and a state three. We don't have a, st a state two, which is the excited state. That uh, 
results from the quantum interference effect. If we set the coupling Rabi frequency or the capital omega C to be much larger than the probe field's Rabi frequency or the capital omega P, the atomic population can be predominantly trapped in the ground state. This setup leads to perfect transparency for the probe field, which is the manifestation of the EIT effect. The atomic response isn't limited to coupling states and spontaneous emission. It can also be described by susceptibility. To derive the susceptibility equation, we need to write down the master equation for the density, matrix, uh, density operator rho. The first term represents the coherent evolution of the atomic system under the driving field, while the second term accounts for relaxation effects, including spontaneous decay and dephasing. To link, this uh, to, to link the susceptibility to the density matrix, we express atomic uh, polarization as a product of atomic density, N over V, and the trace of the density matrix and the dipole operator, which is D. After a bit of manipulation, we arrive at a closed form expression for the susceptibility, which is the parameter of omega or frequency. For the pro field, the susceptibility could be written as following. And as we previously mentioned, at the two photon detuning, uh, previously absorptive medium becomes transparent. As you can see, the red uh, line is the imaginary part of chi and relates to the absorption. And a real part of chi is the dispersion, which relates to the phase shift. Now, let's revisit our atomic system and introduce another level to form an n-type scheme. In our experiment down in the lab at the University of Victoria, we co-propagating the probe and coupling field while counter-propagating the third field, which we call it the control field, the blue one. This situation is described by the following Hamiltonian. Where k and v represent wave vector and the velocity of atoms, respectively. Similar to the previous three level system, we can solve the master equation to obtain chi 3. And this time, we achieve something non trivial cross phase modulation. Cross phase modulation involves modulation the phase of one light with the optical intensity of another. While we might conclude that the reached our goal of creating a two photon interaction gate, it's important to note that there is always a trade-off. Accompanying the phase shift, there is always a loss proportional to the intensity of the third beam and chi-3 absorption. To understand this better, let's return to the n-type scheme. By detuning our third laser far from resonance or the control field, we can break the ground state level and induce a slight shift known as the stark shift. This shift can be controlled using the normalized Rabi frequency squared over the detuning. This ground state shift has consequences. Coupling the third level, the third uh, coupling field uh, to the uh, atom, to the fourth level, we can see the phase shift. We can see the shift in the EIT feature. And that leads to the phase shift, uh, which uh, corresponds to the dispersion curve. Uh, one, thing, one thing to note that is frequencies and phase are uh, proportional to each other, but not uh, equivalent. It means uh, d phi is equal to omega plus uh, phi zero. Okay, um, now this uh, shift in the absorption field means the previously transparent is now partially absorptive. That means we cannot achieve to uh, 
a desirable phase shift without loss. So what's the solution? For, for a remedy, we are uh, introducing a cavity, a fabric probe cavity to decrease the loss and enhance the phase shift by enhancing the coupling between atom and light. The red line in the graph illustrates the system without a cavity, encountering the considerable loss with low phase shift. Conversely, the green line with the cavity showcases reduced loss and enhanced phase shift. Essential parameters here include an S or MathCal F and optical depth or 2 dB. Higher values of these parameters are more desirable. So Finesse is also influenced by the quality factor of the cavity, uh, emphasizing the need for stabilization. So that means we need a higher and uh, better stabilization of the uh, mirror of the cavity. Because if you work in the experimental physics, you know that there is no such thing like a steady state. So always we have some dephasing, something like this. Now, let's look at how we can implement our theories in the real world. So this is our optical setup. Despite the apparent messy looking of this setup, it's the place where I invest the majority of my time. Now let's simplify matters and delve into how we can uh, practically implement all that we've discussed thus far. As I mentioned, in the realm of experimental physics, one fundamental truth emerges: there is no steady state, and atoms are in constant motion. Even beyond that, external factors like ambient noise or unintended electronic fluctuations can destabilize our lasers or even the cavity. This is why we rely heavily on our locking systems to, uh, to to have a remedy for this situation. So our approach involves a series of locking loops. It all begins with the dichroic atomic vapor laser lock or for simplicity, DAVL. Um, DAVL is basically a stabilize the frequency of one laser by locking it to the slope of the absorption profile. Subsequently, after that, we are using phase lock which uh, locks the phase of the second laser, the first one. And then we are using the PDH lock, which we are locking the cavity to one of the lasers. Now let's look at the DAVL, how it looks like. So basically we have laser, half wave plate, uh, polarizing beam splitter, and vapor cell inside the magnetic field. And uh, if you know that after uh, the vapor cell, we can see absorption profile. And if you introduce quarter wave plate and uh, turn on the magnetic field, we can see the phase shift in the absorption profile. And that produces an error signal. And then we can lock our um, laser to the frequency of the uh, desired frequency, which is the difference between those two absorption profiles, which is which has been shifted. And that uh, half quarter wave plate is uh, can be can distinguish those two uh, polarized uh, absorption profiles. That means there's a right circular and left circular lights after the uh, rubidium vapor cell. So here's the thing. In the experimental physics, nothing works. So this uh, Frankenstein, uh, we call it Frankenstein board. Then you see that uh, SMD part is has some longer link, length. So uh, the added longer legs to these uh, SMD because after we found that there is a fundamental flaw in the design. But here's the thing, I could lock the laser and PDH with this. Yeah. So let's look at the phase lock. 
basically we have two lasers and we are comparing the beat nodes of two lasers with OPL, which is optical phase look, phase lock loop. And we are comparing them to the uh, reference signal, which could be optical oscillator, optical no, local oscillator, sorry. And then we are fitting the air signal to the piezo and current modulation, which correspondingly uh, can uh, correct the fast and slow uh, modulations in the phase. Piezo for slow and current for fast. And this is how it looks like after both two lasers are locked together. And this helps to reduce the line width of the lasers because that's very important for getting a good EIT. Now PDH, my lovely one. Here's the thing. We are using cavity to uh, generate an error signal. The back reflection of the cavity goes through the photo detector and that we are uh, adding another phase shift to, uh, to reduce the phase shift between local oscillator and the arbitrary phase shift that might have been happened to the error signal that comes from the fabric probe. And then by mixing them and low pass filtering them, we are using several amplifier or something like PD, uh, PD, PID loop to uh, feed back it to the piezo transducer of the cavity. And that would lock the cavity to the laser. And this is how it looks like. This is the, uh, the purple one is the air signal. And the other one, which is green or black, is the air signal. I mean, sorry, the reflected signal of the PDH. So this is our uh, locking system. Now let's go to the measurement, the fun part. So after we have done uh, everything, how we are gonna extract the phase. So we know that, so actually we are using Moxner interferometer because uh, we can directly measure the phase. Uh, so the other methods are using uh, Cromer's chronic uh, uh, relation to uh, extract a phase shift uh, based on the absorption profile, but that's indirect. Or using heteroline or homodyne detection, those are indirect ways. But Moxner interferometer is a direct way, and actually it's a little bit harder because there is uh, unstability in the mirrors. So as you can see, we have index of refraction, and that index of refraction in the vapor cell corresponds to chi, which contains uh, chi uh, real part and imaginary part. And if you remember, we just care about the real part of the chi because that contains the phase shift. But the imaginary part should be correct for it because that's uh, not good for our experiment. So let's measure it with the telescope. This is how it looks like. The relative uh, bright and dark fringes. Uh, we can see the yellow trace is one of the photodetectors and the other one is for the other photodetectors and they are high phase shift out of phase because those two should be uh, equal to the intensity of the, the first light. So how we are gonna extract the phase this by sitting on one point uh, and after introducing the uh, co uh, control field, we can see something like this. That phase is going up or down, and that is for delta phi. So we are done with the measurement. What is the future steps? So sadly, we know that um, Doppler broadening gonna put the upper limit for how far, how, uh, how how uh, how detuning could be much uh, uh, near? How nearly can we can detune to the state? 
because if you recall the delta star shift is equal to uh, norm squared of the gamma of uh, control over the delta of the tuning. So if we go closer, and the tuning go closer, we can get higher phase here. And Doppler Brown is gonna uh, put some upper limits. So with using cold atoms and cavity inside that, we can circumvent that situation. So that's our future step. And thank you. Thank you so much, Jamal. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for maybe just one quick question. Are there any questions for Jamal? So there's a question from SFU. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the presentation. Um, I was just confused uh, about one of the diagrams you showed. So for the four level system and the, uh, the cross phase modulation, uh, what is it that you use that to do? So why is that used? Uh, so the uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so exactly. So oh, it's our question, oh, it's our shift? Yes, yeah. So a start shift is basically uh, breaking the ground state, and that leads to a uh, shift in the absorption uh, profile, or chi-3. Because uh, now here you can see if you're changing this ground state to lower level, and that requires, that adds another detuning. So essentially, you're you're changing the uh, the detuning window, like the EIT window. Yeah, that's star. right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I see. Thank you. That's the main takeaway from this. Thank presentation. you. No thank you so much, and thank you again, Jamal. No um, I would I would like to invite our third and final speaker for today's seminar. Um, we're going to go back from UVic back to UBC, um, and I'd like to introduce Daniel Julian Neitzert. Daniel is a Master of Science student in the ECE department at the University of British Columbia, and today he's going to be speaking about fiber optics-based quantum computer control and readout. And Daniel is also one of our Enser Create in quantum computing scholars. So without further ado, Daniel, uh, please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? It's a little bit echoey, so if you can get closer to the mic, that would be great. I actually know where the mic is. It's like this. <laughs> Everywhere. Everywhere. Okay. Um, sure. Just speak clearly. We should be okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about fiber optic space quantum computer control and readout. Uh, so just like uh, other people before me have been talking about, uh, I'm also, I guess we're all doing sort of optics related projects. Uh, this is somewhat related to Phil's project in that this is sort of a broader architecture that encapsulates um, some of the devices he was talking about, namely electro-optic modulators. Um, so this is mostly a talk about the sort of architecture level and the motivation for why we're even doing this in the first place. So first, a little bit of background um, on quantum computing and the hardware involved. So uh, a lot of quantum computing these days is done um, with cold microwave controlled qubits is what I'm calling them. So basically what I mean by that is qubits that you'll put in a cryogenic chamber and you said microwave control signals to them. So basically high frequency electrical signals to control the qubits. Um, so the connection to these qubits is traditionally done with coaxial cables, as you can see on the, on the right there. In my presentation, there's just a very large setup that contains a whole bunch of uh, coaxial cables all around the, the, uh, the fridge there, basically. So there's, I don't know how many cables there are in that picture, I think something like 100 or a couple of hundred of them. Um, and this whole setup is basically just to contain 
one little chip with a bunch of qubits on it. Um, so those qubits I've circled in, in red. You can't really see them in this picture, but the idea would be somewhere around there you would mount your chip and you'd connect it to all of these little coaxial cables. Um, and each of those coaxial cables would control one of your qubits um, or a part of one of your qubits. And um, yeah, it's basically a, just a giant refrigerator just keeping that one little chip full. Um, so as a, as a quick little overview as to how we actually control these qubits, um, we use microwave pulses. So essentially we assume they start at a ground state when we start up the quantum computer. Um, then we use microwave pulses to apply these, these gate operations. So just like a, a pulse at a specific frequency with a specific phase and amplitude can essentially perform a rotation around a block sphere. So that way we can apply gate operations. Um, we can entangle qubits by using um, controlled little uh, biasing circuits. So there's like little couplers in between each of the qubits. Um, and we can control um, how much they're coupling using DC biasing. Uh, and Rio can be done with microwave pulses. So we send a microwave pulse into the cryogenic chamber um, and we measure the phase and amplitude that it comes back with. Uh, and depending on the phase or the amplitude of that signal, then we can determine whether the qubit is in a zero state or a one state essentially. Um, so I sort of summarize this in this diagram. So we have a readout input, or we're basically bouncing off this microwave signal shown in blue. Um, and we get a, a readout output from it, and that tells us our qubit state. We have some sort of control line, so we're sending pulses in order to control that qubit. And then we have these, these extra DC lines, which I'm not going to talk about too much today. Um, and we might use these to do things like tuning our qubit. Uh, we use them to control the couplers that I've talked about. Um, you might need them for amplifiers as well, which I'm also not going to talk too much about. But basically, you can imagine there's, there's a couple of different cables in here. Um, but I'm mostly just, we mostly care about these coaxial cables, these microwave cables, um, the reasons that I'll, I'll get to in this next slide. So here I'll identify the problem. So uh, cryogenic cable, cryogenic chambers of limited cooling power. So um, as an example, here's a, Here's an example cryogenic chamber, the Blue Force XLD 400. So this might be a cryogenic chamber that you're using to do some sort of qubit experiments. So they can cool down, um, you can, they can cool down things extremely low. So like millikelvin levels. So you can see on the left listed basically stage names. So um, in this picture back here, each of these sort of levels is a different stage. With this stage being the coldest. So it goes kind of to from 50 Kelvin all the way down to this MXC stage, which is six millikelvin. Um, and uh, in each stage, you may or may not want to mount things. This, this four Kelvin stage and this, this mixing chamber stage are basically the two uh, stages that people might want to do qubit experiments at the most commonly. So uh, you can see the cooling power we actually have, even though this is a, a giant research device. We only have, we have a very little amount of cooling power that we can actually that we can actually use. So we're pumping in a whole bunch of power and a whole bunch of liquid helium, but we are really only getting a little bit of cooling power out. So um, 19 milliwatts, which is tiny in the mixing chamber, and a lot more, 1.5 watts and 4K, but that's still not very much. So basically that leads to an issue where attaching all these little cryogenic, uh, all these little coaxial cables into our cryogenic chamber conducts heat away from the the experiment conducts heat away from the, the chamber. So because of the limited cooling power, uh, once we have enough cables connected, uh, I don't know if you can really see those numbers on the graph, but essentially right here around the uh, around the still stage, you get kind of the maximum number of cables that you can connect, which is about 10,000. But in these places where you can, you actually are kind of interested in doing qubit experiments, you get something more like a thousand cables that you can you can connect. So that's quite a limited number of, of cables. Um, you know that means less than a thousand qubits. And from my picture, you can see that we need to use multiple cables per qubit. So that might be a lot less than a thousand. So clearly, if we do this without 
modifying our set at all, we're going to kind of be stuck at a low upper limit. Um, and there's also a density issue if you go back to my picture again, you know, fitting all of these coaxial cables into the scheme is quite difficult. So we'll need some, some sort of method of fixing both of those problems. So there's a list that I came up with of some of the solutions that I've seen. So there's um, some rather interesting approaches using uh, stuff like single flux quantum logic. So this is essentially logic and uh, circuits built out of Josephson junctions. So you have much less power dissipation in CMOS and we work at superconductive temperatures. Um, but there's, a, there's not that much work that's been done on them. Um, and there's these wireless terahertz coupling. So here we don't even have wires anymore. We're, we're basically just replacing the coaxial cables with terahertz antenna and we're blasting these terahertz signals in. Um, so that's, this is a really interesting approach that is quite new, I think. Um, there's, other, there's other things we could do that I have heard surprisingly little about, like uh, just <laughs> what about building your coax smaller and being less heat conductive? Um, you might still have some problem plugging all those thousands of cables into your chip, but that might be an approach you could you could build bigger and colder fridges, although those probably get very expensive. We're already, you know, these fridges are already like hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So um, you know how much how much larger can you really scale that? Um, and you could of course use different qubits. So for example, uh, Jamal Spare was talking about using Photonic, during photonic quantum computing, um, which doesn't necessarily need to be cold. Um, but the approach that we've decided to take um, that I'll be talking about today is photonic qubit control. So, what that really means is controlling these superconducting qubits with optics. So, what's, what is the key advantage of that? And uh, kind of why, are, why do we think it'll work? So, originally, one of the main problems we had is that each, each of the coaxial cables conducts a whole bunch of heat away from the chamber. So that's largely because they're conducted um, both electrically and thermally. So fortunately, photonic cables, like fiber optic cables, are much less conductive. Um, so they don't have this passive heat load just by sitting there. Um, and each cable has around a thousand times the bandwidth of a coaxial cable. So that means that you can theoretically stop a whole bunch of control signals on the one cable and frequency multiplex them together, and we could get a whole bunch of signals out. So that also drastically reduces the, the number of cables you need. So that's useful both from the heat load perspective and also from the perspective of needing to uh, cram a bunch of signals into one chip. So um, this previous paper, um, this isn't the best estimate because it only takes into account the, uh, the control part of the system. Um, and uh, this is kind of dependent on the type of photo data they're using in the experiment and stuff, but they did an estimate on how many uh, physical qubits you could realize using coaxial cables, which they estimated around a thousand, um, and with photonic connections. So you can see as long as you're uh, here, they, they say duty cycle per qubit, which basically just means how much uh, power you're using to control each qubit. But here, if you're using much less power to control each qubit, you can basically get, um, you, can, you can scale up quite high in the number of uh, qubits you can control. So in theory, this scheme, um, if you're stuffing a lot of, you're not using too much power in each of the signals, um, would scale quite well with uh, towards like the, the million qubit plus goal that we're, we're kind of going for. Um, so I have pictured here two previous experiments that people have done going in this direction. So uh, they've done it in both the control and the readout direction with macro optics. So by macro optics, I mean like you have a, you might have a photo diagram in a box or you might have an electroptic modulator in a box and then you're kind of connecting it with uh, microwave cables and stuff like that inside the cryogenic chamber. So here we basically replace this um, amplifier with this photo, this uh, like electroptic modulator here. So for the uh, readout portion, at least we have an electrical cable attached to our photonic device here, electro like an electro-optic device. So we can send in, whoops, uh, we can send in some photonic signal here, and we can get a photonic signal out that uh, basically has our, our readout information on it. But we're still controlling this 
um, with a, an electronic signal. Similarly here, we're kind of doing the opposite. So um, we're, we're sending a signal in, like a control signal with, uh, with light. Um, and they're controlling these, these, it's being converted to a microwave signal with these little photodiodes here. Um, but in this experiment, they were doing the readout electrically. Um, so there's kind of two issues with this, with these approaches. The first one being that they haven't really put them together. The second being that it, it, uh, it all use, uses macro optics. So um, if we want to fit thousands of qubits inside a cryogenic chamber, having one little box, a big box associated with each of your, uh, each of your qubits is not really scalable. So to scale this, we want to use some sort of micro optical approach. Um, in particular, integrated photonics is a really good way of doing this. So integrated photonics is a somewhat niche field, um, largely used for fiber optic communications equipment and data centers and things like that. Essentially, they manufacture um, optical, um, different optical components directly on a chip. Um, and it's mature enough to have a number of useful devices to work with. So here I just talked about some of them. So photodiodes, you kind of already know what they, they look like. They convert a photonic signal to a, an electrical signal. Um, electroptic modulators is what Phil was talking about. So these convert a, uh, an electric signal to a photonic signal. So those are pretty obvious. Um, and a less obvious one of these ring resonators. So um, as mentioning before, we want to multiplex a whole bunch of signals under one fiber optic cable. Um, so this device is what would allow you to do that. So essentially, if you send in on the input um, one photonic signal with a bunch of um, different wavelengths of light in it, you'd be able to select one signal, one single wavelength of that light, um, and be able to get that out of this, out of this drop port. Um, so we can use these devices for, for multiplexing. Um, so sort of putting it all together, you can come up with an architecture that looks something like this. So this is an architecture that was, was published about um, six months ago or something like that. Um, it's very similar to what uh, we, we're working on at UBC. Um, so they essentially have a, uh, they have a two-way photonic control. So basically the only thing coming in and out of the project chamber is photonic cables. Um, so you set in your photonic signal here, it goes onto this waveguide here, uh, which couples to the ring resonators. And that kind of can take your single photonic cable and spread it out so it fans out the signal to a bunch of different resonators. Each of those goes to one of these diodes, which then goes to each of the qubits. So you convert the, uh, the microwave signal that's being carried on that photonic signal to a, to a microwave signal and that controls the qubit. And then from the qubits, you have some sort of low noise amplifier. So you might have something like a parametric amplifier, a quantum limited amplifier, um, in order to amplify that signal. And then that goes into these uh, into these ring modulators, which is basically a type of electro-optic modulator, um, and they get a signal out. So this sort of architecture, like I said, is very similar to what we're planning on doing, um, but nobody's actually manufactured this yet. This is kind of theoretical. Um, <laughs> like Jamal said, there's a lot of the uh, low problems that come up when you're going from experiment from theory to actual experiment. So here's some of the challenges that I've listed that we're sort of currently working on. So um, tuning of components, all of these components of the circuit generally have to be tuned, like the, the ring modulators might be off. Um, you need to bias photo detectors, um, the tuning of the qubits themselves needs to be, needs to be done somehow. Um, so the, in terms of the uh, photonic, in terms of the photonic tuning at least, normally this is done with heating and PM junctions. Um, so heating, of course, won't really work in project temperatures. It puts a whole bunch of heat into the system. So um, and PM junctions, because of a, because of freeze out, they don't really work too well either uh, at project temperatures. So some other systems of tuning need to be done. There's, um, there's definitely ways of doing it using, a, like Phil was talking about some of the, the chi 2 effects and in different uh, materials and things like that. So if you can figure out the right material to use, you can uh, you can create tunable um, silicon photonic devices. Um, but that's something that's being worked on at UBC right now. Um, packaging is also a difficult uh, procedure. So that's something that I have a first-hand experience with. 
packaging photonic, uh, these integrated photonic circuits onto uh, some sort of PCB or something and putting that inside of your project chamber. Um, it's a challenge in itself. So at UBC, we have uh, some different ways of working on this, like uh, you have photonic wire bonding. There's also other approaches using uh, more traditional packaging techniques. Um, and uh, the behavior of all these integrated devices is basically uncharacterized at these temperatures. So uh, that's one of the main things I'm working on right now is uh, basically putting these devices in the cryogenic chamber um, and doing experiments with them to determine things like the RF bandwidth, um, the responsivity of these photodiodes. Um, and then lastly, for, for the best scaling, you kind of want um, here in this, in this architecture, they kind of propose having two different chips, one for qubits and one for photonics. Um, but of course, that's probably going to be more difficult to scale to like a million qubits or whatever if you're, uh, if you're not integrating everything on one chip. So um, one challenge for getting really high integration would be you want all of your photonics and all of your qubits all on one chip. Um, that process, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't exist yet. And no one's really tried to make that. Um, but I haven't really seen any reason why it's impossible. So I'll we'll have to see uh, that would be something interesting that somebody can, uh, can come up with. So um, yeah, here's my references. And uh, thanks for listening to my talk. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, yes. uh, uh, any questions? I think we probably have time for just one, if there's a question, yeah. Yeah. So um, I have a question for like the graph that earlier in the presentation uh, with the, yeah, that one, the scaling of the number of qubits. Oh, this one. Yeah. 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 So for what I'm seeing here for the photonic link, if you have low duty cycles and you can go up to around a million um, mm -hmm. physical qubits. Um, but the question is, is, does that still mean that there's a fundamental limit on how many qubits you can go because what if say in the near or far future when we actually have a computer and we were and then we realize oh actually we need like 10 million yeah, yeah, yeah. then what would we do yeah so there's definitely you can definitely nothing scales like infinitely um there's there's probably other ways of getting more orders of magnitude in this kind of scheme like you could like here, for example, they, they have two plots, one for different, uh, these, these impedances is really the impedance of the, uh, the transmission lines on the, on the chip. So, for example, one way to, to scale higher would be to have a higher Z, like they say here. Um, you could scale by having like more bandwidth in your fiber optic cables, things like that. Um, but yeah, ultimately it will hit some kind of upper limit. Um, and then who knows, you might have to completely change how you do everything. It's very similar to like, um, if you look at old electronics and you compare them to like, I don't know, like 40 years ago and you compare them to, to nowadays, you know, everything's completely different. They integrated things much more into like SOCs um, instead of having everything spread out in different chips, um, things like that. So yeah, definitely in each sort of, as we scale up further and further and further, I think, definitely have to move on from this method probably eventually um, if we want to have like a billion qubits but you know for now definitely we're all the way down here sort of at like the like, right now like IBM is something like 400 qubits that may or may not work very well so <laughs> they have a, we have a long way to go with this method I think um, and uh, probably an experiment this like <laughs> Nothing ever works properly, so probably experimentally these these lines are a little bit actually a little bit lower than this even. But um, yeah, hopefully this will take us somewhere into the future, and then people will come up with new techniques to go even further. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. I want to thank all of our speakers today, Jamal, Philip, and Daniel. I would also like to thank. Uh, Kiro, Olivia, and Alex for hosting the in-person meetings, and of course, all of you for attending in person and virtually. Um, please join us next month on September 12th for our next seminar. Thank you so much.